Good afternoon, all. Hard to believe that already we're getting to the point where we're starting to do the, what I call the groundwork, setting up for the feast. The cooking starts tomorrow. Mm. Um, a lot of preparation went into setting up for that. We have been talking back and forth with uh, the folks in New York, and we are expecting quite a few. Had a call from a few people from even in the area that are going to come up. I may note the fact that this is probably providing some miracle. This is probably going to be the last time we'll be at Utica, and hopefully after that we will move on to other horizons. But that's the plan. God may have a bigger one and a better one, but that's ours. Now, we have come to the most challenging part of this series. This is where we separate the lies from the truth and find out what we truly believe, what we believe in, and what we trust. And that's different because we don't understand in this day and age what belief is. Belief just says, I accept that it exists. That doesn't say that you have any fealty to it, you don't have any trust in it, and you don't say, I will follow this through fire. We don't say that about too many things. And some of us don't even say it about the things that we should say it about. I've seen people where somebody breaks in your house and we used to be a man would jump out and in front of family and pre pre present himself. You got to get through me. You see now, somebody comes in the house and this guy runs out the back door, leaves the women and children to deal with what they've got to deal with. Belief is different in these days and times. As a result, the choices that we make may seem simple on their face, but it's obvious that we, as believers, have been halting between two opinions. Not everybody, I'm not necessarily talking about the people in this room, but as believers as a whole. Anyone that would hear this, anybody that understands what I'm saying, we've been halting between two opinions. Now, from the Isle of Patmos, the Apostle John gave us a direction that was clear. It was, if you recall, the starting point of this series. Going back to our spiritual roots, the roots that hold this series together, let's read it again and remain sure of our direction. Let's drop anchor at Revelation, the 12th chapter, the seventh verse. Revelation, the 12th chapter, the seventh verse, where it says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels, but did not prevail. Neither was their place found anymore for them in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. A quick glance around at what is preached on television, on radio, and those things that are taught in this world tell us that many in this world struggle with that sentence. They have quite a bit of difficulty wrapping their minds around that sentence. Yet, they think that others are deceived. But they themselves are not. Yet, it is apparent that many of us are. 
But the mystery we're going after is simple to solve if we place our trust in the right place. We want to know how and when the world began. We have to, have to do it like this. We have to do it like any good detective would do it. When detectives arrive at the scene of a crime, they first look at all of the evidence. And if the evidence is confusing, they look for witnesses. If reliable witnesses can be found, they are interviewed and their testimony is used to solve the crime. But the easiest cases, any detective will tell you, are those that are solved because the perpetrator is found and confesses to the deed. That's why I don't understand why so many are confused about this subject and have been for so long. We have a witness. We have the perpetrator, although he has us in possession. But we have the perpetrator of the deed. He confessed to everything. And the witness, his son, verified it. Let's go to Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, the eighth verse. Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, the eighth verse, where it says, bring out the blind people, yet there are eyes. <laughs> and the deaf, yet there are ears, to hear him. Verse 9. Let all, that word is H1471, Gentiles, a masculine noun meaning nations, people, Gentiles, country, or nations, they be assembled. Let them, let the people be assembled and let the people be gathered. Who among them can declare this? and cause us to hear formal, former things. Let them give their witness that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, says Yahweh, and my servant whom I have elected, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no L, H410, or Elohim. There was no L formed, nor shall any be after me. I, I am Yahweh, and there is no savior besides me. Don't miss this. This was Elohim, the son, speaking. He was speaking to the Israelites who just as many of we modern believers have forgotten their creator. And when looking for the creature for answers, when they could easily have been given the answers by their creator. Verse 12, I declared and I saved, and I proclaimed and there is no alien Elohim among you, or no alien God among you, and you are my witnesses, says Yahweh, and I am El. Yea, from this day I am he, and no one delivers from my hand. I will work, and who will reverse it? <laughs> once, I put, once I put something out there, who's going to change it? Who's going to do anything to it? Who's going to destroy it? and none have reversed any of it. Oh, it has been horribly corrupted beyond man's ability to repair it. <laughs> much, of, much of it by the destruction wrought at our own hand. Yet, we deny the creator. We deny the creator and in the same breath blame him for all that goes wrong on this planet. 
It's time to hear the truth and not be ashamed of it. Title is Matrix of Satan, part seven, almost done. Beginning lies and the corruption of sin. Sin causes corruption. It does. And eventually ends in death. Death of the planet, death of all of its life forms, and eventually the deaths of the inhabitants who continue in sin as did the first two, Adam and Eve. Although some folk don't believe in them either. They dispute the Bible, but we'll get into that later. It's interesting. But in order to get to the heart of this mystery, we will use as our source the testimony of the only two witnesses we have. I trust them to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Our Elohim, both, were there. Now how do we know that is the truth? Well, either it is or Yahweh is a liar. John the 17th chapter, the 7th verse. 17th chapter, the 17th verse rather. John the 17th chapter, the 17th verse where it says sanctify them in your truth your word is truth <laughs> now let's go on into the true word of Elohim Genesis the first chapter the first verse And just to break it down according to the original languages, I will, for the first time, probably in a long time, be using the King James Version. Genesis, the first chapter, the first verse, where it says, In the beginning, God, or Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Now, hold it right there. Hold it right there. Did anybody hear that? Whoosh. Anybody hear that? I didn't. Good. <laughs> I didn't either. Now, explain what I'm talking about. You see, some Bible scholars have declared that this is where you will find proof of the gap of millions of years. You see, there's a theory called the gap theory, which says that the six billion years that the planet has been here, as declared by scientists, they claim this is the true age of the Earth. And they say that it is found here in an editorial trick used by the transcribers of the King James Bible. According to this theory, Genesis 1-1 represents the time of creation. But Genesis 1-2 moves quickly through that time and this verse on instantly transports us billions of years forward in time after a satanic creation that Elohim's destruction of by water ended it. <laughs> At least that's what they say. This they say. They say this and they say that this accounts for the advanced years and age of the earth. But they can't have all of these theories going at the same time or they wind up making fools of themselves. Some also say that the flood never happened. Yet they do say, check this out, they say that a meteor hit the earth. Well actually, depending on who you talk to, they say that Two or three meteors hit the earth. And that 
these meteors cause successive ice ages. And these ice ages were the result of these meteors hitting. And after each meteor hit, the population had to start up again. Thus, the Cro-Magnon man came first, then Neanderthal man, and then those who were there just before Homo sapiens, that would be us. But all of these species were found over billions of years. Now I ask you, if everything died a couple of times, not just once, if it died a couple of times, how did everything start over from nothing? Plus, they always tell you when you're trying to find the culprits in like culprit in corrupt corruption in, in corporate, always go for the money. Even here, go for the numbers. Let's do some math. Let's use their logic and assume that the earth is six billion years old. And after that last meteor hit, we got, going, got things going pretty good. You know, we started living, moving into all of the different areas. The, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, after this meteor hit, after this ice age, all of a sudden now, instead of the whole world being cold, it went back to regions of heat over here, cold over there, rain over there. You know, the way we see it now. But we got going pretty good and, you know, started to do what we were told, you know, being fruitful and multiplying from the frozen amoeba lying around after the second or maybe it was the third ice age. I'm not sure which one. But there were some frozen amoeba ran around. We don't know what they were, but they became us. But maybe after this third ice age, and they lived on. But let's, just for the sake of conjecture, let's not use six million years. That's a lot of zeros for a small little guy like me. So let's just go back 41,000 years. Is that okay? That's four times more than the 10,000 that we believe, somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 that the Bible really does kind of justify. But let's go back, just to make it really interesting, let's go back five times further. Let's go back 41,000 years ago. And let's use some real interesting numbers. You see, the world population growth rate in recent times is about 2% per year. Practical application of the growth rate through known human history would be about half that number, about 1% per year. You bring in wars, disease, famine, etc., and every year, <laughs> show you how bad war is, we've wiped out approximately one third of the population on average every 82 years. Starting with eight people and applying these growth rates since the flood of Noah's day, that would be about 4,500 years ago. That would give us a total human population of, check this out, seven billion people. Now, I'm figuring, well, how many are actually here? So I went out to the United Nations website. Anybody write this down if you want to check these figures. www.worldometers, W-O-R-L-D-O-M-E-T-E-R-S dot info right slash world population right slash. You go there and this cute little grid comes up. And it'll give you a running count of how many people live on the planet at that time. 
I did it last night about 6.15. As of 6.15 p.m. last night, on the planet were 7,524,720,800 people. Roughly 75 and a quarter billion people. 7.5 billion people. And that's just about right, because that's the figure that you base on the growth rates based on 4,500 years ago. Works for me. And as I said, that is a live count. So if you go out there now, it's probably going to be a little higher than that. Interesting along with that are death counts, abortion counts, disease counts. Some, it's a lot of information there. If you go out there, you'll be like, wow. He had no idea that they cared so much about us, that they count us all. There are other counts that you may find interesting, like I said, but this application on an evolutionary time scale runs into some major difficulties. You see, if you begin to count population trying to use their count, even if you use our very conservative count of 41,000 years, if you count that from 41,000 years back up to now, with the current population counts and the wars and all the other death, you would still come up with, put your thinking caps on, you would come up with a total population of two times 10 to the 89th power. That's 20 zeros plus 89 after the comma. Anybody heard this number before? That would come up with 89 octavigentillion people, 89 zeros. Now, no, I'm not that smart. There's a site where you can plug in the number of zeros and it spits out a very accurate number. And I would say octavigentillion, 89 octavigentillion people is a whole lot more than 7,524,620,800, wouldn't you say? Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. That's way more than 7 billion people which does work within the biblical time frame, which is amazingly accurate and tends to prove creation by the timeline of God. But to go to Genesis 1, 2, it says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But these numbers, I keep going back to these numbers. They say you go back six billion years. Now, if you're going to come up with octavigentillion people after 41,000 years, you think you got an overcrowding problem now? Imagine how many people would be on this planet if it had actually been here for six billion years. And by the way, I did look. I, there ain't no number for that. It's beyond Google. It's beyond Google. It would be so many people. Now, now I'm going to be honest with you. God has a, he has a sense of humor. He may do a count after the thousand years, after all the people are in the kingdom, and we go out and repopulate the other planets. And then you might find him come up with a Google, 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 Vigentillion something and be completely accurate. Know all their names, know how many hairs are on their heads, know how, what color their eyes are, how many teeth they have, and all of that. But it won't be this. Certainly not on one 
planet Earth. Can't happen. Impossible. So you don't even have to go through all of their other stuff. All you got to do is go straight to the numbers. And the whole thing falls apart very quickly. That's why I notice when you ever hear evolutionary people talking, they never want to talk about the numbers. Because the numbers pull them over to the side and go, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. But I digress. Verse 4. And Elohim saw the light, and it was good. And Elohim divided the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. In the evening and the morning, note the sequence, were the first day. On the second day, Elohim created the land and placed it between the sea and the canopy of water above. This is called a greenhouse effect, which gave all locations on the planet a uniform temperature of roughly 78 to 80 degrees. This was covered last week in Matrix 6, and we had a problem with the sound, so if you weren't here, you missed it. But we will repeat it. I'm not sure when yet. I'm thinking probably during the feast, but it's, it stands so well on its own, we probably wouldn't have to do the whole series, just do the one. So we will redo part six at some point. But we did go through a lot of this then. On the third day, grasses, plants, and trees were formed. On the fourth day, came the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the fifth day came the birds and the creatures of the sea. Now, here we have to listen when Elohim is talking to us. Now, let's notice something very simple here. Person, perhaps this is why the evolutionists missed it. They were looking for something overcomplicated and something they could explain to you in big words and you would be sitting there scratching your head and you wouldn't know. This was just too simple. Genesis, the first chapter, go to the 20th verse. The 20th verse of Genesis 1. And Elohim said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that has life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And Elohim created great whales and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. And every winged fowl after their kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. Now, notice in verse 21, every living creature after their kind. Now, the Hebrew here is the word H4327, men. A masculine noun indicating a kind, a species that indicates an animal or something that shares common characteristics. In other words, it blows apart that whole concept of a frog evolving into a hummingbird or a monkey evolving into a man. So all that idea of, I'm, oh wow, I'm a monkey's uncle. No, forget that, not there. Man can't evolve into a monkey or any of the other evolutionary concepts that are commonly spoken of as if they're law rather than a fanciful theory. Dogs, for instance, adapt to their environment in order to survive. But no matter what it does over any span of time, no matter how little, what little changes they make, it's still a dog. It doesn't turn into a fish. Each animal was created, and notice I didn't say designed. I believe intelligent design to be a compromised position to evolu evolution. If it was created by God, and these myriad human and animal creations have held up and survived despite the insanity that sins of Satan and man have wrought 
on the earth. It is obvious that design, that the design and the designer are of a level of intelligence that we may never see again. So you really kind of overkill when you say that is intelligent design. The, in, the designer himself is the pinnacle of all intelligence. So you don't need to say that. Everyone completely understands that. And those who don't will understand it when we meet him. He told us already, but apparently some still don't believe it. He told us in Isaiah, the 55th chapter, the eighth verse. Isaiah, the 55th chapter, and the eighth verse, where it says, for my thoughts <laughs> are not as your thoughts, neither are your ways as my ways. And he explained that. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts more than your thoughts. In other words, don't insult me by calling me intelligent. I am intelligence. For as the rain comes down and the snow from the heavens and does not return there, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall be prospered in that for which I sent it. In other words, everything I send out is going to come back having done exactly what I wanted it to do. What did the Apostle Paul say of the truth of God in Romans, the third chapter, the third verse? Romans, the third chapter, the third verse, where it says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? <laughs> God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man as it is written, that you might be justified in your sayings and might overcome when you are judged. In other words, all of this is set up for you to come to an understanding, repent, and come into the kingdom of God and become a member of the family of God rather than be judged. And I warn you, if you repeat what you're hearing today in public, I can guarantee you that even some believers who have bought into the world's concept of the evolution of God's creation will laugh at you and call you a fool. I've heard enough. <laughs> but stand firm. Because you see, in the end, all who follow the truth of God will be vindicated. Now, on the sixth day, he created man and woman. And now it gets interesting. On the seventh day, he rested and set in motion the concept of the Sabbath, which the people of Elohim keep to this day as a sign that we are his. Exodus, the 31st chapter, the 13th verse. Exodus, the 31st chapter, the 13th verse, where it says, Speak also to the sons of Israel, saying, Truly you shall keep my Sabbaths, plural. For it is a sign between me and you, and that the implication here is that they all are a sign between me and you, throughout your generations to know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you or sets you apart for a holy purpose. Go down to verse 17 right there in Exodus 31. Verse 17. 
It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And they still argue that. Oh, maybe it wasn't six real days. Maybe it was, he was talking about eons of time. No one can create that much that fast. Didn't he just say, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, my ways higher than your ways? What's wrong with thinking a little bit? Ex Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, the 12th verse. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, the 12th verse, where it says, And also I gave them my Sabbaths, plural, to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am Yahweh who sets them apart. Huh. Adam and Eve were loyal. For a minute until Satan, the devil, placed doubt in their minds. When Eve trusted Satan and she and Adam took and ate fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they began a cycle of corruption that is devastating in its scope. But again, because we have lived in that devastation pretty much all of our lives, and have only watched it get worse and we really don't know how to fix it and those who we chose as our leaders don't know how to fix it and they seem to be doing more messing it up further than fixing it. Unfortunately, <laughs> despite the evil, despite the insanity, despite all the other things that go on, we have truly known no other life. It seems good and logical to us that it is this way. Some of us, it just doesn't make any sense to me, but that's just me. Thus, many of us are blissfully unaware of the totality of the consequences of the first couple's sin and all of our subsequent fall. Because few people talk about it, because most people will tell you, even some ministers will say, I'm not even sure I believe there ever was an Adam and Eve. Well, where did you come from? Again, the word of Elohim told you how perfect it was, but we missed something. The creation is not perfect as it is now. We will see it more fully as we go forward. Seeing the contrast will help us see it more clearly. You see, back in Genesis 1, notice that after Elohim created everything, he declared that it was good. The Hebrew word here is H2896, to be, to be, an adjective meaning good, well-pleasing, fruitful, morally correct, proper, convenient. This word is frequently used and encountered in the Old Testament and is roughly equivalent to the English word good. I'd say that was a pretty good translation, wouldn't you? Good in terms of its function and scope of meaning. In other words, there was nothing wrong initially in the creation. It was perfect from the perspective of Elohim. Nobody else's thoughts matter. But notice what happens once sin creeps in. Adam and Eve sinned by doubting God, and Yahweh had to step in and punish them. Part of the punishment was their banishment from the Garden of Eden, and a lot of people still don't quite understand this. This was a punishment, but it was also, as we will see, a protection. You see, had they eaten of the tree of life after eating of the tree of, good, of the knowledge of good and evil, they would have lived on in a state of abject sin 
and Elohim would have had to kill them and all of their offspring, just as he will one day have to kill Satan. Why? Knowing this, it also follows that the tree of life must have had some virtue, something within it, by which the human body could be kept free from the decrepitude of age. Or the decay that, determ that terminates in death. Its name, the tree of life, accords with this conclusion. Only on such a ground could exclusion from it be made the penalty of disobedience and the occasion of death. Thus here we may resolve all of the difficulties which physiology presents to the immor immortality of unfallen man. It has been said by the sages that there was an herbal virtue in paradise capable of counteracting the effects of the wear and tear of the animal frame. In other words, something about that tree of life, why do you think they're gonna give it in the millennium? Why do you think they're gonna give it afterward to those who come, who have, were raised in the second resurrection with illnesses? They'll eat of this fruit, whatever it is, and be healed. This is consistent with everything we've heard of this fruit. This confirms this account of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, however. Death, which it is to be remembered, is to a moral and responsible being in a comprehensive sense, exclusion from the blessings of conscious existence. The two trees stand related to one another in a way that touches the very center of man's moral being. Do this and live is the fundamental order of the law. Its implied counterpart, however, is this, do it not, and you shall die. The act of disobedience is evidently dis decisive for the whole conduct, character, and relation in relation to God. It therefore necessarily forfeits that life which consists in the favor of God and all its consequent blessings, the two trees correspond with the condition and the benefit in this essential covenant of law. The one is the test of man's obedience or disobedience. The other, the benefit which is retained by obedience and lost by disobedience. Man fails in obedience and loses the blessing. Henceforth, both the legal and the beneficial parts of the covenant must now come from a higher source. A higher source to all that are to be saved. Who? Yeshua, our Messiah. Who bestows both the one and the other by his obedience and by his spirit. In the old form of the covenant of grace, the Old Testament Passover typifies the one, circumcision, though temporary, the other. In the new, the New Testament Passover and baptism, they have a similar import. Baptism and indwelling of the Holy Spirit removes the necessity of circumcision because it goes from the physical realm into the spiritual. These all, from first to last, show forth the two essential parts of salvation. Redemption, then, after it's all done, regeneration. In the new body, raised up at our res resurrection, at which time our lives will, in obedience, live on forever. This is a clear example of the unity and constancy which prevail in the eternal works of the Godhead. Again, this was made necessary that man was removed from the garden for his own good. And as Elohim pulled back, 
as we've heard so many times before, nature abhors a vacuum. As Elohim pulled back because of sin, Satan jumped right in to fill the void. In Genesis 3.21, God or Yahweh kills an animal that is not described here in order to make coverings for Adam and Eve. Now, and I've been hearing people say it was this and that and that and that for I don't know how long. Didn't it say right here that we did, he never said what it was? So how do you know? This is thought by many to be the first sacrifice for sin. Some assume that Adam and Eve may have eaten some of the meat for the first time. That's an assumption. In time, however, after Cain was born, he killed his brother Abel because he was jealous of Abel's willingness to please Elohim through his sacrifice. This separated man from God even more. Satan at this point probably began to experiment with the nature of animals. For those of you who really find it offensive to watch Animal Kingdom and some of those things where the lion goes out and just, just takes and rips apart. Didn't you ever feel like, is this really the way this is supposed to be? Anybody has, anybody just thought that? Just throw a hand up. This doesn't make sense. But at this point, Satan began to experiment with the nature of animals, which along with man were only eating vegetables and grains at the time. We've already been through this last week. But those with the right digestive systems, the right teeth, the right claws, could kill and eat other animals, provided that their behavior was changed to move in this direction. For humans, being a can carnivore is just as much psychological as it is physiological. I've tried it a few times. I've cut down, but I can't say, oh, I'll never eat meat. I'll never eat meat again. No, I can't say that. The psychological part, how do you say that? The physiological part is strong. <laughs> the psychological part is a little weak, but we're working on it. You see, animals simply follow their nature which obviously changed at this time. Man, on the other hand, it's all between your ears. You can think just about anything, and if your mind is strong enough, you can make it happen or not happen. That's the difference between men and animals. The spirit in man gives you an edge that the animals do not have. But other things happen, and as, and as time marches on, we see things change even more. For example, in studying these different TV shows and watching about animals, we learned about the Kia parrot. Parrots are, for the most part, vegetarians, even though they have the beaks and claws of a carnivore. For a long time, most of them still simply eat grains, nuts, leaves, so forth. However, the Kia parrot of New England, which ordinarily only ate grubs and roots, but a little problem with the ecosystem there dried up a lot of the grubs and roots. But a dwindle, so a dwindling food supply is forcing them into doing something different. So what do the Kia parrots do? They're now attacking sheep. The parrots are now seen attacking sheep and ripping open their backs and feeding on the kidney fat of the sheep, which I guess you might imagine makes the farmers rather upset with the parrots. <laughs> so the farmers are forced now to keep watch to keep the now vicious birds from attacking and killing their sheep. Huh. Of 
course, now you say, well, I don't know anything about what's going on in New Zealand, but maybe you've seen this. Let's take it a little bit closer to home. The seagulls that you see all over outside, that used to be only seen on the lakefront here in Chicago, <laughs> naturally ate the algae found on the lakefront. But back in the 80s or so, for zebra mussels were accidentally dumped into, into Lake Michigan and all along the Great Lakes by Asian merchant ships who I guess they shot, they, they shoot ball of mud, just water out, just dumping the water out that they collect over the time of shift shipping. And somehow zebra mussels had gotten into the water supply. When they dumped out all the water, they dumped the mussels. These things are rather like most unclean things. They multiply unbelievably. And over the last, oh, 15 to 20 years or so, they've eaten up almost all of the algae along the Great Lakes. These mussels began to eat all of the algae and the plankton along the lakefront. Unable to find their usual food sources, these seagulls now fly inland. You go out there right now, I guarantee you'll see one. They fly inland. And now they'll eat pretty much anything they can find. Initially, they ate garbage. You throw a piece of a burger, they'll eat that. But I noticed something. A lot of people would feed them scraps. Early on, if you threw out, say, a burger, they'd eat the bread. They'd eat the pickles. They'd eat even the ketchup. It was funny to see them sometimes walking around with ketchup on their beaks. That was funny. But if you threw them meat, they wouldn't eat it. They wouldn't touch it. They would not touch it. Hmm. I can only say now, beware of the seagulls. I went out once just to see what would happen. Took some raw meat, threw it out there. They will eat it now. They will eat it now. When you feed them just about anything now, not only will they eat it, if the others are in the area and see you feeding them, they will swarm you. They will swarm all over you. They only seem to want whatever you're gonna feed them. They won't go after you, but it has that same hazardous ugliness. How many of you, if you go downtown, walk around the pigeons, and then it's like, ugh. you have to push, kick, or, they, or they'll, if they think you've got something, they swarm you, just like the seagulls do. They're just a nuisance right now. But as things get worse, it could become a hazard. But you see, this is an, a, this is an example of a component of the evolutionary scheme, which is true. It's called adaptation. Adaptation is this. The clinical definition is this. Modification of an organism or its parts that makes it more fit for existence under the, under the conditions of its environment. A heritable physical or behavioral trait that serves a specific function. In other words, any seagulls that are born from these seagulls will automatically now eat whatever they eat. These specific functions improve an organism's fitness for or survival. Now this part of what they call evolution is true. Anything will make small changes to survive. You see, after man's fall, Satan manipulated the nature of animals and they began to prey on each other. This was around the same time that Nimrod came on the scene and man was just as, if not more violent than the animals. Truth be told, by now, God had seen enough. He had had enough. Genesis, the sixth chapter, the sixth verse.
Genesis, the sixth chapter, the sixth verse, which says, And Yahweh repented of having made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And Yahweh said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the animals and the fowls of the air, for I repent of having made them. In other words, I'm so sorry I made these things. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahweh. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with Elohim, which means he knew of them both. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth corrupted itself before Elohim, and the earth filled itself with violence. And Elohim looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And Elohim said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. I will destroy them with the earth. Kind of think of it like when you would do something if you all were, anybody was raised in the south and your mama would make you go out in the back and get a switch and bring her back to whoop your butt with it. I will destroy them with the earth. <laughs> what a just punishment. You have corrupted my perfect world by casting your lot with Satan. I will turn that world against you. As with everything else, Elohim gave Noah perfect instructions for constructing the ark. It took almost 100 years. It, after all, would sit on dry land for nearly a year, I mean for nearly a year, a year, not a hundred years. Make that one year. Get it right, Ray, come on. He gave him perfect instructions for the ark that it would all sit on dry land for nearly a year. Had to be it right because the shakedown cruise would not be a dress rehearsal. Especially when you're carrying all the residents deemed worthy to live in the cleansed world. Now, for a few shocks. As if we haven't had a few already. Although it is fully disputed by believers and a lot of theologians as well. As evolutionists, there were dinosaurs on the ark. <laughs> Along with everything else. God sent seven of every clean animal into the ark and two of every unclean. Proof that this distinction of clean and unclean was destined to continue after the flood. Genesis, the seventh chapter, the second verse. Genesis, the seventh chapter, the second verse, where it says, you shall take to yourself from every clean animal by seven, male and female, and from the animal that is not clean by two, male and female, for obvious reasons. You know, pigs make a whole lot more babies than cows do. They're going to multiply a whole lot faster, so we don't need that many of them. Verse three, and take of the fall of the heavens by seven, male and female, to keep alive seed on the face of the earth. So we're on to verse 7, right there. And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife, and his sons' wives with him into the ark, because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls and of everything that creeps upon the earth. There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as Elohim had 
commanded Noah. There were no exceptions. Therefore, dinosaurs must have been on the ark. How do we know that? Where did, this, where did the skeletons come from? <clears throat> Even though there was ample room in the huge ship for large animals, perhaps God sent young dinosaurs into the ark, not the big ones, so that they would still have plenty of room to grow and so the others would have room. <laughs> well, the doubters say, what happened to all the land animals that did not go on the ark? <laughs> That's a stupid question. That's a real stupid question. But the interesting thing about it, it answers where the other animals came from. Perhaps the ones that Satan changed into meat eaters, Tyrannosaurus rex or so forth, and, they, and there's so much. They're finding out now that most of the, remember the, you would study dinosaurs as a kid and you would find out this one, that, and then you'd look at them later and wow, this one doesn't look the same. Oh wow, we found out that this doesn't go with this. This goes with that, and that goes with that, and the ichthyosaurus was that and that, and we find out that a lot of the things we thought looked like this don't look like that because they got the bones mixed up because there were so many of them. Part of also the reason why they weren't allowed onto the ark. They were corrupted by Satan. They were eating people. They were eating and tearing up everything. But you can find all of the fossils at all different levels of the earth, which proves that they were there. And they're finding, what was that thing they found? Sielikoth, uh, or some swimming dinosaur that they thought was dead. That they're, they're finding the things in Australia. <laughs> they thought they would, they, oh, they're extinct. There aren't any more. What was that? Science is amazing. The mistakes they make and just cover it up by that's not saying anything about it. Amazing stuff. Well, anyway, they asked the question, well, what happened to all the animals that go out on the ark? <laughs> Very simple. They drowned. The ones that didn't go on the ark, they drowned. <laughs> you see, this would have been those that were corrupted by either Satan or the sin of man. Many would have been covered with tons of mud as the Rampaging waters of the flood covered the land. Because of this quick burial, many of the animals would have been preserved as fossils and possibly disconnected as time went on, explaining why some of the animals, they weren't put back together, right? Because they couldn't find the whole fossil as it lived because of the drift. Now, if this happened, wouldn't you expect to find evidence of billions of dead things buried in rock layers formed from this mud? If you do any studying, you find out that's exactly what they are finding. Billions of these animals all over the place in different layers. And they can't determine what the layers are because it all happened at once. Fascinating thing happened in Australia again. These people were there for a volcano that erupted. And the erupted came back and came down on a tree. The scientists came in, looked at the tree, and says, wow, this tree has been here for billions of years. From the strata, the, 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 you know, the, lo the, the logical succession of strata, they call it. I remember this from college. Never mind, <laughs> I, I flunked that class. But not because I didn't know what I was talking about, because I disagreed with the teacher. But we won't get into that. But, They said the thing had been there for millions of years. They found out that what happened was when the a volcano flew forward, all that lava, the lava came down in the exact strata that they claim will tell you that something has been here for billions of years. The same thing happened in Seattle when Mount St. Helens blew. 
It blew and buried a tree that had only been planted about four years. The scientists came out, oh, this tree has been here for millions of years. And they found out that the tree had only been, the guy that planted the tree was still alive. He said, I only think I only planted that thing four years ago. Egg on your face. But this is how it is. Every, almost every measure that they've used to prove that we've been here for billions of years has been disproven. Everything. But the thing is, they found everything that proves everything that the Bible says, the flood, all of that. But they don't know, it can't possibly be true. He can't be telling the truth. No. My thoughts, your thoughts. Don't forget that. We forget that. We conveniently forget that. You see, sin, getting back to the point, was the breaking point for Elohim. In Genesis 6, we read that all flesh, man and animals, had corrupted their way upon the earth. We read this back in Genesis 6, 6 12. People and animals were killing each other. Maybe dinosaurs had started killing other animals and humans. In any case, the Bible describes the world as wicked. And as I said earlier, I believe Satan by now had changed the nature of animals. But God always, for those who doubt, he will leave a little something. He'll, live, he'll leave a couple of breadcrumbs for you to figure out if you have such a mind. Let's go to Job, the 40th chapter, the 15th verse. Job, the 40th chapter, the 15th verse. Now behold, what's that word? Behemoth. Now behold behemoth, that translation is Hebrew, 4994, 4994. A masculine noun referring to a very large animal. The translation word is behemoth. Which I made along with you. This is God speaking. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his loins, in his force, in the muscles of his belly. He hangs his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are like tubes of bronze. His bones like bars of iron. He is the first in the ways of El or Elohim, H430. His maker brings near his sword. For the mountains yield food for him, and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus in the hiding place of the reed and the marsh. The lotus tree covers him in its shadow. The willows of the torrent circle him. Behold, he is confident, even if Jordan burst forth against his mouth, shall any take him before his eyes? In other words, were they going to take him alive? or pierce his nose with snares? Who's gonna take this thing and make it a, a beast of burden? No one. Now, you do the research, it's interesting. Some scientists say this is an elephant. Unless elephant has done some amazing evolving. Have you ever seen an elephant's tail? Doesn't look like a cedar, does it? No. And others say, oh, it's, it wasn't an elephant, it's, it's a hippopotamus. I used to take Rashida to the zoo every Friday. By the time she was two, she knew the names of all the animals, including the hippopotamus. And she would have told you that the hippopotamus has a little bitty little tail like this, not like a cedar. So this had to be something else. But almost every commentary and every dictionary says that it's either an elephant or hippopotamus or hippopotamus. 
an elephant's tail, nor does a hippo's look like this. Yet, no one seems to know what it is. And most believers won't touch it because they don't want to go against the evolutionists and the other theologians who don't wish to trust the word of God. Yet Elohim says it was one of his first creations. One of his first creations, one of the first animals he created, so it must have existed. Now, if you look at the, the books, I'm thinking maybe it was a brachiosaurus. That's about the only thing with a huge tail like that. Yet the fossil record finds they, these animals were found on the same geological plane as humans. So the idea that they lived billions of years before, how could they live, unless they were in a time machine, I don't see how they could live around the corner from you four billion years back. Back to the future. Never mind. Reference is too old, that was 1985 or so. Okay. Interesting though, the word dragon is used a number of times in the Old Testament, at least in the King James anyway. Creation scientists believe that dinosaurs were called dragons because the word dinosaur was only invented in the 1800s. Now, we wouldn't expect, if this is true, to find the word dinosaur in the Bibles like, say, the authorized version or the King James Version, which was codified in 1611. 1800 is 200 years later. Unless they were in a time machine, they had never heard the word dinosaur. Once we begin to look with honesty into these things, we see that these lies, however, have a reason. They want us to believe in this old earth for two reasons. One, if we think that God has been allowing us to be down here for this long and suffer this long, obviously he must not care about us. I've even heard scientists say this. We will accept the ways of the world and not the ways of Elohim. <laughs> Listen to it. I mean, it's, it's amazing stuff. If you listen to what theologians have said, even theologians who say that they believe, if you really listen to their words, they seem not to believe the word of God. Herbert Merchant said, to science and not to the Bible, must man look for the answers to the question as to the process of man's creation. What kind of theologian is that? Dr. Charles Matthews says, a correct understanding of Genesis shows that the account of creation is no more than, is no more denied by evolution than it is by the laws of light, electricity, and gravitation, all of which were created by God. The Bible deals with religion. In other words, the Bible is not a scientific book. <laughs> Dr. Maynard Metcalf also argues, there is no conflict between the Bible and the fact of evolution, but the literalist interpretation of the words of the Bible is not only childish, but is insulting both to God and to human intelligence. These are theologians. These are degreed individuals saying these things. So I guess, I would think, you know, so as well, I guess if I were to try to justify, well, why would you say this? Why would you say these things? I mean, I guess, if nothing else, you gotta justify all those thousands of dollars you spent on learning this stuff, right? You had to go to school to learn it, right? You can't say, oh, well, I, I, I. I heard a guy say it, though, years ago. He said, man, this is, I could throw that away. 
for what, I, for what I've learned from after that is what has guided my life. Pastor Woodland out in, uh, Pittsburgh, in, uh, in Baltimore, he said, hey, I could have thrown this away because I learned more out here dealing with these people than I could have learned there. But what this did for me was allow them to listen to me and think that I knew something. But now I do. But what does Paul say to Timothy? In 1 Timothy, the 6th the chapter, the 20th verse. 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, the 20th verse. We've been through this before. It says, O oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Turn away from pointless talk empty talk and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. The Greek references it, and I think I found it funny when I, when they, when I first saw it, but it makes perfect sense. He, he, what they call false knowledge, he's called pseudonymous gnosis. <laughs> false knowledge. The more I read about the study of evolution, and it came on the scene back in the 1800s as with the, anybody remember that book, The Bell Curve, that came out around 1990 or so? I read it. I'll never get that two days back. And I ain't real happy about that either. That book came out in the mid 90s. Evolution came along and seemed to justify the bigotry already extant in the New World. That's what they called all the lands discovered by Christopher Columbus. Talk about pseudonymous gnosis. <laughs> we see God and his word were already being drummed out of all of the colleges where it was previously taught as the anchor. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, University of Chicago. And evolution was becoming the rage in all of them. I haven't gotten into the technical aspects of the evolutionary arguments because, frankly, they've already been refuted. They're easily refuted by sound scriptural knowledge. But of course, they don't believe in that, so you're a fool to use that. So call me the prince of fools. The evidence is plain to honest biologists. Just as with the short study of how many people would overflow the earth if we actually had been here for four billion years, <laughs> that <laughs> when we would be overcrowded by trillions after only 40,000 years, we came at the right number when we say that the earth has probably been here between oh, six to 8,000 years or so. Then you come up with that seven million number that we all know so well. It would be scientifically ludicrous to go longer than that. But evolution wasn't about how many people are here. It was about keeping them all in line. Evolution speaks of Races. If you ever read any of Darwin's stuff, I've got about four books on that stuff, and I, I said I can't present this. This is insanity. But evolution speaks of races. When science has proven that there's only one race, the human race, Homo sapiens. We've been through all of this before. Almost got lynched, but we won't go there. Race, you see, is a social construct divided and derived mainly from perceptions conditioned by events of recorded history. The construct has no provable biological reality. If we all say that we believe that we came from Adam and Eve, the only discernible differences in human beings came when Elohim corrupted their languages at the Tower of Babel. These people migrated to different parts of the world after 
The flood changed the climates and the earth tilted. Those who went to warmer climates developed darker skin. Those in colder climates developed lighter skin. The climates in different parts of the world over the years brought on a different and differing cultural imperative based on what they had to do to survive in those differing climates. Different ways of life and cultural changes that reflected the differences in how they had to live to adapt to the climate that they found themselves living in. Despite these cultural changes, people are all the same. If you got different people from all over the country, just, just took a little prick and put all their blood out on a, on a sheet. Only with DNA could you determine who was white, who was black, who was da 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 da. And all of these are political terms. They don't say anything about who we are, but in this present scheme, we can say, you're a slave. You, you look at type in different things. You say beautiful woman on the, on the internet. Everybody comes up as white. You call them exotic beast, or exotic woman. Everybody comes up as dark skinned. That's nothing but bigotry. It has nothing to do with the beauty of anybody. It's, rape, it's bigotry. It's racism. It's all it is. And that's really all evolution is all about. The lies that were taught by the church for years the saying that Shem, Hammond, Japheth, all sire, different races of people, is a prevarication of the lowest order. In the field of genetics, researchers have concluded that the genetic difference between people brought on by melanin level <laughs> accounts for point zero point one one twelve or one twelve thousand of one human level of bio, biological variation. Let's get the numbers straight. Out of 20 million strands in a DNA molecule, melanin is decided by four strands out of 20 million. Sounds like God thought color of the skin was real important only in terms of filtering out the harmful rays of the sun. It has no other place. Therefore, all of this talk of race that you hear in the world today is nothing but what did uh, Seinfeld talk about his show? He said it was a show about nothing. That's what race is in the modern context. It's a, it's a show about nothing. Because if you divide four by 20 million, the number you come up with in terms of we're going to give a dollar for each one it comes out with, that numerical number is zero. Who wants their money now? Didn't think so. But you see, this is why Satan has pulled out the big guns to make race such a big deal. Bigotry has caused most of our wars False religious tenets have caused others via church bigotry. Greed and theft of land and resources have caused all the others. If you don't believe it, look at the oil wars that are going on in the Middle East right now. All of this fueled by said bigotry, except for now, instead of land niggers, they're talking about sand niggers. Oh my God, he said nigger. Yes, I did. They do it all the time. And some of us do too, because we're so bought into it, we hate ourselves. It's sick. It's sick. Many of our problems in the world and in the church have been caused by bigotry and sin. We need not get into the specifics of it. We've all touched it in one way or another. We see what's happening in the world right now. Lack of resources, violence, bigotry, the division between the haves and the have-nots, which is the biggest thing going, but you never hear about it on the news. 
and why there will never be a resolution of this imbalance until the return of Yeshua. And the attitudes of those who claim to be set apart by Elohim. Uh-oh. They seem to be acting no different than the people of the world. If we don't turn it around, this Satan-induced, evolution-fueled hatred is going to keep some of us out of the kingdom of God. You see, God's family is all one race, the human race. And those who will be in it <laughs> will shed our human skin. So what are we hanging on to? What's the point? You see, when we become spirit and become beings like Elohim, how do you expect to live on forever with people and work on projects with people that we can't get along with now? How? We who keep his commandments and trust and obey his son will one day stand before him and see the proof of the singularity of his creation. Despite their differing hues. And if we are shining as the sun, what difference will it make anyway? Just wondering. On that day, standing on that sea of glass, we will realize that we have all been fed a pack of lies by Satan and his witting and unwilling. You see, Many of us don't yet realize just how fully we're being used. But just before the point of no return, Satan will always expose you to the truth to twink your nose and let you know, gotcha. That you've been used, you've been had, you've been hoodwinked, you've been bamboozled. And it'll be too late to turn around. The window of opportunity will have closed shut. Like Adam, like Eve, like Cain, like Judas, you will realize that you have been used because of your separation from God. Please don't let that separation be because of bigotry and hatred and greed caused by this world, because that would make you all witting accomplices to Satan. Let's shut it down. John, the eighth chapter, 28th verse. If you know the truth, an amazing thing will happen. John, the eighth chapter, the 28th verse, where it says, then Yeshua said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do these things which please him. As he spoke these words, many believed upon him. Then Yeshua said to the Judeans who believed on him, if you know, if you continue in my word and you are my disciples indeed, and don't miss this, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Let us all work to be free of the lies and hatred of this world. You see, we will be free if we do that, of Satan's matrix. If we simply trust the word of God, even if the whole world calls us liars. Next week we end it all. Epilogue, part eight. God bless you all.